welcome. My name is Jeff Resnick. I'm Chief of the History of Medicine Division at the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you for joining us today as we kick off the 2022 series of all virtual NLM history talks. And to those of you on Twitter, thank you for following along using the hashtag NLMHistalk. NLM History Talks promote awareness and use of NLM related historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the NLM to recognize the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe. And also, the talks foreground the voices of people of color, women, and individuals of a variety of cultural and disciplinary backgrounds who use these collections to advance their research, their teaching, and their learning. We supplement NLM History Talks with speaker interviews on our blog, Circulating Now, located at circulatingnow.nlm.nih.gov. I'll add that NLM History Talks are made possible by an outstanding team here at the National Library of Medicine and at NIH Video Casting, and I want to thank all of them for their time and their talent in bringing this program to you the public for free. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to call your attention to the next NLM History Talk to be offered by Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of the Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Join us on Thursday, February 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time to hear Dr. Owens speak on the subject of what history reveals, slavery and the development of U.S. gynecology. Today, I have the great pleasure and privilege of introducing Dr. Alexander White, Assistant Professor of Sociology and the History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University and School of Medicine, where he is also Associate Director for the Hopkins Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine. Dr. White joined the Hopkins faculty in 2019 after completing a provost's postdoctoral fellowship at Hopkins. He earned his BA in Black Studies from Amherst College and his MSc in Sociology from London School of Economics and Political Science, and his PhD in Sociology from Boston University. Dr. White's research is located at the intersections of the sociology of race and ethnicity, history of medicine, and global historical sociology. His research critically investigates global racial formations and how racial forms of governance, rooted primarily in imperial projects, have produced contemporary social phenomena. Dr. White has published extensively in social science journals on the topics of racism, slavery, and medicine, including the journal Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, Theory and Society, and Social Science History. Dr. White is the editor of the volume Global Historical Sociology of Race and Racism, and he has published in medical journals, such as the British Medical Journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, and The Lancet. Dr. White's first book, Epidemic Orientalism, has been accepted and is forthcoming at Stanford University Press. This book explores how epidemic threats become the focus of international management, regulation, and control, as well as the political, economic, and racial ideologies that have shaped international coordination to stop pandemic spread. Since the emergence of COVID-19, Dr. White has produced a further line of research to address the challenges of this continuing pandemic. Supported by grants from the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development through the Hopkins Population Center, he has worked to develop a COVID-19 social science data hub. This data hub collects and manages county level data on socio-demographic and health factors that influence the spread of COVID-19. In addition, he has helped to draft recommendations for safe, informed, effective, and collaborative vaccine delivery to minority populations in the United States. This report was published by the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and in the Journal of Health Security. And it was also profiled in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other media outlets. As an expert in epidemic responses, Dr. White has briefed Congress on COVID-19 responses, and he has written for or been interviewed for uh, roughly 30 print online and television news reports by outlets including CNN, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, National Public Radio, and Der Spiegel, and others. Dr. White joins us today to share aspects of his research related to his overall research and forthcoming book. Please join me in welcoming him to the National Library of Medicine virtually to speak on narratives of pandemics past, archival approaches to understanding the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. White, over to you and sincere thanks for your time with us today. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for, for such a warm introduction and for, um, and for having me. 
Um, it's really a pleasure. Um, the NLM has been an amazing resource, resource in my work um, and, and in my research, and also for, for my students who I teach at, at Johns Hopkins. So it's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, so what I, what I want to speak about today really pertains to um, the, the book that, that Jeffrey mentioned um, that I'm working on um, and will coming out next this year, Epidemic Orientalism, and the ways in which really um, archival work and the materials within archives not only explain to us you know, how um, past pandemics were responded to, but also the sort of meaning-making systems that emerge around pandemics and the ways in which we can think about how pandemics produce meaning in the social, political, and, and scientific world. So I want to begin actually, um, well, very much so in the, in the 19th century with a particular quote from um, Mary Shelley, which I'll read. I spread the whole earth out as a map before me. On no one spot of its surface could I put my finger and say, here is safety. In the South, the disease virulent and immedicable had nearly annihilated the race of man. Storm and inundation, poisonous winds and blights filled up the measure of suffering. In the North, it was worse. The lesser population gradually declined and famine and plague kept watch on the survivors who, helpless and feeble, were ready to fall an easy prey into their hands. I contracted my view to England. Oh, the overgrown metropolis, the great heart of mighty Britain was pulseless. Commerce had ceased. All resort for ambition or pleasure was cut off. The streets were grass grown, the houses empty. The few that from, necess that from necessity remained already seemed branded with the taint of inevitable pestilence. In the larger manufacturing towns, the same tragedy was acted on a smaller yet disastrous scale. Now, when Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley was writing her masterpiece of Gothic science fiction, The Last Man, she probably would have been aware of the cholera pandemic or epidemic spreading across India and Southeast Asia. In her book, which envisions a global pandemic plague eradicating the human race in 2094, Shelley locates the seed of the disease's spread in the expansion and conquest of the British Empire eastward. As an overconfident British Empire conquers Constantinople, it unleashes the plague which had laid low the city after traveling from Asia into Egypt and ultimately to present-day Turkey upon the hapless and unsuspecting Western Europe. The juxtaposition of colonial exploitation, trade, and conquest echoed in the siege of imperial in the siege of Constantinople, and this opening quotation encapsulates the uneasy and destabilizing realities made possible by imperial European invasion around the world. In the 19th century, diseases previously unseen in Europe for some time began to spread back from the colonial dominions taken over through imperial capture back fundamentally to the Western Europe. Shelley's vision is of a dying world, in particular a dying Europe and a dying Britain, pulseless from physical death, from disaster and the collapse of imperial economic, and the, of an imperial economic world system that had ceased to be. The paired phenomena of pandemic catastrophe and the subsequent economic plague that quickly followed crept from the furthest outposts of British colonial dominion back through Europe and ultimately to the metropoles of Britain itself. Shelley, as her character narrates, spread the whole earth out as a map. But like all prescient science fiction, she may well have been ahead of her time. She lays out a fictive geography of relations, of political and social power as told through disease. Her narrator begins with an eye cast to the south, the origin points of the plague where it's virulent and untreatable. Moving closer to the north, the disease ravages lands nearer and nearer to home until ultimately focusing on Britain. Writing in 1826, Shelley could not have known with any certainty that the way of seeing and dividing the world that her character lays out will become in many ways a dominant frame through which disease threat will be understood in global politics for the next two centuries. Shelley sketches out simply and in fiction several aspects of what I should be calling epidemic orientalism, a way of apprehending and recognizing infectious disease threat that is very much based on the ways that the West has come to see itself in relation to the rest of the world. The ongoing global pandemic of COVID-19 perhaps has laid bare the politics of global relations and work at the heart of pandemic governance. It is much clearer now that an epidemic, far from signifying solely a biological threat to life, is also an economic and political phenomenon which produces cascading and conjoined 
effects, including xenophobia, nationalist fervor, and racial oppression, as well as the exposure of health effect of the health effects of racism and its stark violent disparities. So the history of international infectious disease control, which I want to talk about today, and regulation has largely been one in which powerful imperial European and North American nations have held them up as have held themselves up as the exemplars of sanitation, health, and hygiene at risk from the diseases of much of the rest of the world. But for what ends? What have historically been the rationales and justification for international cooperation over infectious disease control? How did epidemics become the object of regulation and international control? How do these questions affect which diseases become the focus of international response and which do not, or which epidemics become the focus of international response and which do not? And the argument of my work is that in order to understand how global health priorities are set for international disease response, how infectious diseases are addressed and regulated, it's not sufficient to examine the biological or epidemiological conditions of epidemics. In addition, to understand first and foremost how epidemic disease threat is considered, perceived, and acted upon, we must locate the epidemic threat within the landscapes and meaning in which they are situated. Epidemics have historically been constituted as dynamic and complex forces representing a biological threat to life, but also a threat to trade and travel and to economic enterprise. To read and understand epidemic emergencies through any single register is to flatten their manifold significance to a variety of different aspects of social life. To understand the complexity of epidemics, the responses to them and their role both in history and the present, we must locate them the actors and other institutions and political forces organizing responses to them within these landscapes of meaning, the historically situated modes of thought that surround and shape the context of action that determine how and why certain responses emerge and the forms they take. Epidemics, far from being purely biological phenomena, exist in a domain represented and regulated by human produced conventions and international agreements that legislate the responses to them consider how to appraise their risk and standardize interventions. And these regulations too, therefore operate according to so certain logics or beholden to certain assumptions and anticipate particular types of threats and not others. So my work looks at the ways in which these systems are produced, why they form the structures they do and how this has affected our visions of epidemic emergency. So any scholar really fundamentally uh, engaging with questions of power from a place of analysis and epistemic analysis must consider the role of sources, whose voices are driving the narrative and whose are silenced. This is not explicitly a story of resistance to systems and structures of power, but rather analysis of how certain structures come to be and the struggles associated with them. The majority of my, my research focuses on um, you know, the, the emergence of what um, of, of the international sanitary conventions and international health regulations, which exist today. And I'll talk about them in a little bit. But I drew very significantly from the materials within the National Library of Medicine, in part because the NLM has one of the only full um, and complete records of the meetings, minutes, and proceedings of the international sanitary conferences that produced the first international sanitary regulations for the control of infectious disease. So these are stories of large bureaucracies, international officials, and major voices within the scientific community. And I want us to think about this in terms of um, something that Maynard Swanson wrote about and, and paraphrased from earlier writers in his um, foundational piece of sanitation syndrome in 1973. But when we think about epidemics, we must think about them um, in many ways as not creating abnormal situations, but rather sharpening existing behaviors which betray deeply rooted and continuing social imbalances. And I think fundamentally, we can see the ways in which these rooted and continuing social imbalances operate in epidemics, um, especially while we're living through them, but also by looking at the histories of human responses to epidemic threat. So when we think about epidemics, we traditionally, um, in terms of scholarship, um, we have several assumptions that are made that I think you know, bear, uh, bear some challenging and bear some um, complexifying. Acute, fast-spreading epidemics of infectious disease have historically not been in the domain 
or included within the critical phenomena of social analysis. Perhaps this is because they occur often so quickly and they seem to dissipate before sustained ethnographic or critical inquiry is possible. Certainly the epidemics that resist control and containment for long periods, such as the HIV AIDS pandemic, have produced the most sustained investigation and have reshaped social thought in numerous ways. The most, most sustained research into what I would call acute epidemics, such as the recent epidemics of Ebola virus disease in West Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo, the epidemic of Zika virus um, last decade, or yellow fever epidemics, most often arise in a fuzzy domain of global health research, where focuses by and large on the concerns and health problems occurring in the developing world, leaving spaces like Europe and North America outside of the realm of direct analysis, say for migrant populations and the international organizations and geopolitical entities involved in health policy making. Whether intentional or not, much of the thought produced within the domain of global health upon infectious disease by its focus on the developing world, perhaps would overassume the differences in dynamics shaping epidemic responses and crises based on this distinction between the West and the rest of the world. This distinction is not without support perhaps from the beyond the domain of social theory. And the early 20th century in Europe and North America witnessed an epidemiological transition of the dynamics of disease risk and causes of mortality. And certainly important scientific con contributions to understandings of germ theory, contagion, and the isolation of pathogens made infectious diseases something that could be controlled. The development of sanitation syndrome, excuse me, sanitation systems in much of Europe and North America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries made food and waterborne diseases in urban areas a far lesser concern, making cities a far more salubrious environment than rural areas. The development and understanding of mammalian and insect vectors of disease brought scourges such as bubonic plague, yellow fever, and malaria into novel domains of control, especially in the West where effective eradication campaigns against them were waged. Policy and public health measures in the 20th century in much of Europe and North America shifted questions, shifted towards questions of chronic disease, issues of social medicine and population health. The eradication of smallpox and the mostly successful eradication of polio and the development of vaccines against childhood diseases like measles, mumps, and rubella have made these formerly devastating illnesses in the West's cosmopolitan centers a concern only um, if there's significant um, lack of vaccination or of anti-vaccination discourses take hold. By the 1980s, and especially after the eradication of smallpox, there was fundamentally some optimism that the era of infectious disease may be over for humanity. The merciless pandemic of HIV AIDS shattered this belief even though after now, uh, though uh, even at now after hundreds of millions of lives have been lost, HIV AIDS has become a chronic disease that can be controlled and managed in pharmaceutical and bureaucratic ways. The dynamics of which of course shift drastically by geography, access to resources and health inequalities and apathy. Indeed, biomedical and technical optimism had led prior to 2020 to the somewhat comfortable acceptance among the leaders uh, and many, though not all, health actors in Europe and North America, that major epidemics or pandemics, especially of novel diseases, are rare or unlikely to occur in as devastating a fashion as they can in the rest of the world. Dr. Peter Piot, the discoverer of the Ebola virus, in an effort to calm concerns and stigma around the threat of Ebola arriving from West Africa to the UK, suggested that he would happily sit next to an Ebola sufferer on the tube or the London underground system, suggesting at once not to be frightened of the disease, but also that because of the dynamics of contagion and the health systems in the UK, that it was very unlikely that the epidemic dynamics that had occurred in Liberia, Guinea, or Sierra Leone could occur in Britain. In this moment of that West African Ebola epidemic, it was suggested that the crisis the world was witnessing playing out via media outlets on social media or phones and televisions would not occur over here. The scenes of doctors in their negative pressure suits with much publicized limited access to personal protective equipment, overworked and at high risk for contracting the disease themselves, were portrayed as a ghastly reminder of the limited capacities of African health systems to care for their populations. In places far away from the epicenter of the epidemic, we watched as well as victims of Ebola virus disease died lonely deaths far away from their loved ones 
to be buried under intense sanitary controls with formal ceremonies, without formal ceremonies carried out by their families. The prolonged epidemic was blamed on quote unquote West African cultural practices and widespread ignorance of science, mistrust in doctors, and host of other banal actions that outside of an epidemic were barely scrutinized, but under the harsh gaze of illness had now been pathologized as the markers of a backwards people and unhealthy behavior. Social distancing practices, isolation, quarantine, and curfews were seen as the scrambling practices of a bygone era, wholly alien from the sanitized spaces of modern hospitals and cosmopolitan streets of American and European urban metropoles. These tropes of chaos, horror, and cultural incommensurability with modern medicine harken back to the early 21st century discussions about South African presidents Thabo Mbeki and Jacob Zuma's HIV AIDS denialism and claims that the disease could be prevented by showering. Epidemics of these diseases disproportionately having greater effects outside of the overdeveloped West than within highlight perhaps um, a myth whose cracks are emerging uh, today under COVID-19, highlight a myth of the yawning gaps between Western modernity and the rest of the world. So to bear witness, I would argue, uncritically to the history of global health in the West is to perpetu perpetuate in an exercise in myth-making that we should reconsider. It is to take part in believing that through biomedical intervention, sanitary development, and international controls, the West is able to separate itself from the parts of the world suffering from infectious diseases, and thus is somewhat superior in its civilization. The elimination of many disease threats over the course of the 19th and 20th century are some of the most powerful signifiers of Western modernity's capacity for progress through scientific rationality and bureaucratization. The construction of this myth of modernity built from epidemic control obscures the ways in which it is built upon histories of colonialism, racism, and global political organization that has maintained effective systems of disease control that are privileged the geographies of Europe, North America, and the economic interests that they rely on to maintain political power in the world. Similarly, we like to think that there's, a, um, there's been a significant periodic change between perhaps the, the period of global health from the 1940, late 1940s and 1950s to the present versus the um, what we might call eras of colonial medicine and international health prior. And I would argue that as we look at um, some of the material that I'm going to be presenting today, that these, these histories and ideas of distinguishing between these periods, um, especially the ways that we think of epide epidemic thought, excuse me, epidemic threat may not be as distant to our current moment as we would like to believe. I hope to analytically engage with the histories of international health in a different but complementary way. The international sanitary conventions and the international health regulations today exist somewhat um, out of time and out of step with these dominant framings and these histories and logics of international health that I want to trouble. So how does a disease event become an epidemic? This is a question of, of meaning making and somewhat sociological inquiry. The question of first may lead us in an epidemiological direction, which would have us attempting to calculate the reproduction rate or infectivity of a disease, rates of transmission, severity of illness, et cetera, in order to understand the threat in terms of, the of its spread and lives lost. This approach might apply techniques and policies, scientific knowledge and practices of public health developed through medical and social scientific research, supported by national and international organizations like the US Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization to respond to the natural phenomenon of disease emergence. Thus, one mode of analysis may explain the practices and policies put in place to assess how an epidemic emerges and how a threat is divine, defined through policy and best practices. This analysis may provide us with an understanding of why certain strategies were taken, why certain calculations were made, and how an epidemic is defined given a particular ecosystem of policies. However, what systems of knowledges, relations of power, and practices of bureaucratic rationalization were organized to constitute an accepted, naturalized understanding of an epidemic that'll, um, that allows for the creation of policies to control their spread? What are the governing logics of international infectious disease control? What sorts of symbolic, political, economic, and social relations are assumed or made real and legible in the management of disease? And how do these affect the construction and responses 
to epidemic emergency? Well, to explore that, those questions, I look at the, international, the history of the international sanitary conventions, the international health regulations, and the wider universe of what I call international infectious disease control. So since 1851, the international spread of infectious disease has been the focus of international coordination and concern, and a single set of regulations have largely governed the spread of infectious diseases in humans. Over 30 years before the Prime Meridian Conference, um, which established the standard 24-hour day, beginning and ending in Greenwich, United Kingdom, the major empires of Europe, the Persian and Ottoman empires convened the first international sanitary conferences to establish a global sanitary order. These early sanitary conferences did not set out to establish global health regulations for the objective of the effective provision of healthcare for all. These first conferences and conventions aim to produce standard agreements for the effective control of disease without hindering global trade. From 1851 to 1938, 14 conferences were held to standardize international regulations for the establishment of quarantine and the sanitary management of plague, cholera, and yellow fever, as well as later um, typhus and several other diseases. In 1892, the first international sanitary conventions were adopted, codifying the first agreements for the prevention of the international spread of disease. These conventions aim to maximize the protection from disease with minimum effects to trade and travel. Plague, cholera, and yellow fever became the focus of massive international concern due to their threat to continental Europe and the economic threats the diseases posed to trade. So unlike other areas of international and global health, such as products, projects of disease eradication in the mid 20th century, or even the anti-HIV AIDS projects led by large entities such as UNAIDS, PEPFAR, or the Global Fund, all of which seek some sort of equity in global health outcome, the domain of infectious disease regulations has retained significant uniformity in its vision. The, IH, uh, the international sanitary co conventions would become, uh, after the emergence of the WHO, um, the international sanitary regulations and later the international health regulations, which we have today, which were most recently revised in 2005 and now are slated to be revised once more um, in, in, in light of COVID-19. And what's fascinating is the uniformity somewhat in the overall vision of these regulations from the 19th century to the present. The international health regulations mandate is the same today as it was in the 1890s during the international sanitary conferences. The maximum prevention of the spread of infectious disease with a minimum effect to trade and traffic. While also prioritizing those diseases um, and epidemics that can threaten global economic orders, they've engaged, I would argue, in a project of signification, signification and meaning making that have advocated interventions around the world in the interests of Europe and North America. The creation of these conventions and regulations are not only a matter of, of seeking to protect Europe and North America from external disease threats, but also act as a sort of authoring um, what's become a Eurocentric vision of modernity into being. And for this, um, I want to talk about some of the theories that I draw upon uh, before engaging with more of the empirics. And I draw um, specifically from the work um, in large part of Stuart Hall and, and Edward Said to think about the ways in which policy and, um, and the production of regulations require a particular vision of the world in order to produce them and in order to understand epidemics as a whole. So in 1992, um, Stuart Hall wrote a piece called The West and the Rest, which suggests that rather than merely being a geographic space constituting largely Western Europe and North America, um, the West is also a historical construct which creates the appearance of a unified whole. Um, the classification of Western versus non-Western rather than a stricter of fundamental difference is a tool with which to think and produce knowledge and allows characterizations and to classify societies. It sets a certain structure of thought into motion, and it also functions as a part of language and a system of representation. And it also provides a, steer, a criteria of evaluation against which other societies are ranked and judged on a timeline of development against the West. The West is developed and good, which equals desirable, the non-West somewhat seen as un undeveloped and undesirable. Edward Said, of course, the author of the book, work Orientalism, 
um, claims that Orientalism, a way of seeing the West, or the way of seeing the rest of the world in relationship to the West, is in short, the Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient, rooted in the practice of claiming and understanding, and thereby the authority to control it. Now, Orientalism represents chiefly a colonizing worldview rooted in a perspective of Western superiority that allows for distinctions and divisions to be drawn and claimed between the Occident and Oriental cultures, people, and spaces. So when we connect these thinkers together, we see the ways in which a view of the world is constructed, especially one located in the West, that makes it appear to be a settled entity representing a settled geographic container. But in these um, epidemic responses and controls and systems of regulation that are produced that I'm gonna talk about, we see fundamentally um, a way of seeing the world that comes about that prioritizes the interests of the West over the rest of the world. And I propose a concept of epidemic Orientalism to describe that particularly durable landscape of meaning, the discourse and viewpoint rooted in Europe's first engagements with the rest, with the rest of the world as colonizer, to which Europe has recognized itself in relationship to its colonies. And epidemic Orientalism describes the undergirding logics that have motivated and persisted in certain forms since the international sanitary conferences to present and to which all, um, to the present, and to which all actors um, really in the work that I look at seem to respond. And I would argue that epidemic Orientalism is marked fundamentally by the geographic representation of the world through relations of disease threat to the West, the interpolation um, of it, or the, the, the construction of visions of innate difference and inferiority signified by disease, and the production of a particular progressive vision of disease control that elevates uh, the West above others. So I want, now that we've gone through a, a host of, of theory, I want to apply a little bit of concreteness to these concepts and terms. So I want to provide three um, quotations here that describe um, and, and, and claim to argue for the new, new forms of regulation of infectious disease control. And what I hope to demonstrate here is that in each of them, we see fundamentally this particular framing of infectious disease threat as um, in, in this or epidemic orientalist frame. And um, I'll let you read them as I, as I discuss them. It's no coincidence in the 150 year history of internationally coordinated infectious disease control, we can find surprisingly identical justifications for systems of epidemic disease management. The employment of the specter of the increased pace of trade as a potential cause of increased disease spread has been invoked from the 1890s to the present, creating a geography from which to perceive the threat of epidemic. We find that while the threat of epidemic is ostensibly the concern at stake in the history of international disease control, the perception of epidemic threat has at times been mediated by a host of wider factors. The ultimate forms these regulations for controlling infectious disease would take over time are embedded within existing concerns for global economic flows and trade, new or hastening forms of mobility, and a need to control population movement through the remote management of bodies and geographies. These concerns have historically been especially focused upon European colonies in the Indian Ocean and post-colonial spaces worldwide. In short, the framers of the International Sanitary Conventions and the international health regulations of the present have been uniquely concerned with imposing or maintaining a particular system of relation upon the world and maintaining that order in opposition to the threat of certain infectious diseases that might upset that order. So these three quotations, by example, were each uttered in response to the form of the international sanitary conventions or international health regulations. The first from 1892, which is up here, um, the second from 1956 down here, and the third from 1988, reflect a continuity in modes of thought and perceptions of disease threat. In each, the deadliest threats emerge from the darkest parts of the world, the lands beyond Europe, the jungles, the distant continent, and reflect an immediate threat to an already defined Western perspective. Each of these quotes seek to prevent the spread of disease in a manner consistent with keeping particular forms of relation as they have always been. In the first quote from Adrian Proust, a uh, noted physician and health actor, who incidentally was also the father of Marcel Proust, the um, 
the author, um, who's, he was a representative of France to numerous international sanitary conventions. He depicts Europe as beset on all sides from, by the threat of pestilence. The colonies of Europe reflect the possibility for great economic exploitation, but also great risk. The objective then must be both the maintenance of colonial economic relations and the establishment of a sanitary boundary between Europe and the sites of European colony. In the second, the quote from the government of Ceylon, present day Sri Lanka in 1955, the same preoccupation is presented, though updated to accommodate the looming threat of pandemic disaster through swift air travel. The threat is the lone traveler afflicted with yellow fever, capable of devastating the rest of the world. Finally, in the quote from noted, micro, um, noted microbiologist and Nobel laureate, Dr. Joshua Lederberg, Despite the humanistic calls to not close ourselves off to human suffering, the specter of a distant inhabitant coming to the shores of America haunts his vision of the future. So I would argue that these three quotes set up a particular vision of the vision of the world that persists across the time periods considered um, you know, from the, 18, the 1800s to the present, that the epidemics that most threaten the globe are the ones that emerge in the distant lands of what was once colonial exploitation, now perhaps politely described as the developing world, and travel to lands unspoiled and unprepared for such pestilence, almost always reflexively Europe and North America. So in these moments and in these quotations, we see a whole idealized geography mapped out before us. For to understand how disease control operates, it's not sufficient to understand the biology of these most pressing threats, but also the assumptions of those assessing them. In these quotations, we see a world where the threat, where threat is seen and must be seen through the eyes of those with their feet firmly planted, not at the site of epidemic occurrence, but rather in the distant um, places where these epidemics may one day reach. These quotations are a window into the landscapes of relations um, onto which epidemiological and medical knowledge are mapped with the omnipresent but unstated purpose of recognizing epidemic threat foremost as that which threatens a, a division of the world that divides West from rest. So it behooves us to ask the question of how and why, in spite of over 100 years of medical advancement and major global and economic transportations, perhaps does such an enduring perspective of the world of epidemic threat endure? Now, the effects of this epidemic orientalism through time um, I want to trace out a little bit more. As a result of the international sanitary uh, conventions and conferences, what we saw were a host of, of effects. By focusing um, the control of infectious diseases, preventing threats primarily of disease emerging um, or arriving on the shores of Europe, heightened security and bias against non-Europeans who are blamed for spreading disease historically emerged in aggressive and res um, xenophobic responses carried out in the name of health controls. What the international sanitary conventions allowed for was, especially in terms of relations in the early 20th and late 19th century, was allowed for the ostensibly the embargo and, and closure of colonial ports to trade to um, Europe and, and the West. And this would have cascading, obviously, um, major economic effects, both for imperial trade, but also for the colonial economies in those places. And at times, as I'll, as I'll demonstrate, this had devastating effects um, for the local population. In 1901 in Cape Town, South Africa, um, which was then the Cape, British Cape Colony, an epidemic of bubonic plague resulted in the quarantine and forced removal of most of the city's Black African population to a racially segregated quarantine camp. And this camp and the practice of eviction could be viewed as part of a blueprint for future forced removals and a precursor to racially segregated South African townships during apartheid. Similarly, scrutiny, um, similar scrutiny was a feature of the policing, especially of the Hajj and the threat of cholera um, traveling from um, primarily uh, India and the Indian subcontinent through the Persian Gulf and to uh, Western Europe and the Mediterranean um, between really 1892 and 1938 in particular. Under the International Sanitary Conventions from 1892 to 1938, Muslim pilgrims traveling from India were perceived in Europe as, this, as a particular threat um, for the spread of disease. Quarantines and controls were enacted on Muslim pilgrims who traveled both from India to Mecca and then back to Europe 
after pilgrimage. The disease surveillance and sanitary systems that govern the Hajj has historically been, and still is, one of the largest in the world. And this anxiety around the Hajj emerged from particular concerns of Muslims traveling back from India to Egypt and then on to Mecca, where they would interact with European Muslims who would transfer cholera back to Europe. Um, rather than focusing upon eradicating the disease at source or controlling it um, or, 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 or eradicating its causes, the focus of control turned to its prevention of transfer to Europe. The suggestion was for the Ottomans who controlled Mecca at the time to erect massive quarantine facilities in the Red Sea. Britain maintained a reticence to accept the cholera was emanating from its Indian colony, but accepted in the late 19th century that sanitary measures would be needed to change in India. And the focus of reforms would be placed upon the surveillance and control of cultural practices, such as cremation and the internment of bodies in the Ganges River. But the rendering of the world entire in relation to disease threats posed to Europe culminated in 1866 in particular in um, suggestions being imposed outside of Europe for the benefit of its, own, of its own population. While populations beyond Europe's borders were rendered incapable of hygiene and effective sanitary controls within the, con the International Sanitary Conference discussions, especially without European intervention, a particular emergency proposal that was brought forward in 1866 at the International Sanitary Conference in Constantinople um, also rendered certain populations disposable to the interests of Europe. By forcing closure to sea lanes to pilgrim travel, Muslim pilgrim travel um, through a particular French proposal, the emergence of cholera in Mecca would potentially leave tens of thousands of pilgrims without food, water, or shelter in the Arabian desert or force them to cross it on foot. And this grim fact was raised by the Ottoman and Persian delegations in protest. So in protest of this French proposal to close off sea lanes to Mecca in the event of um, cholera arriving in Mecca in 1867, or 1866 and seven, um, the Ottoman delegation made this plea that the assemblage of crowding and indefinitely prolonged, of crowding and definitely prolonged in towns already compromised beyond expression would infallibly result in the creation of immense pestilential foci not the foci, not one of their inhabitants would survive for more than a few days. And these towns of living sentient beings would soon be transformed into necropoli. But if a murderous epidemic devastates the holy cities, if famine and thirst multiply the ravage and horrors of the Indian scourge, cholera, a hundredfold, can we believe that their populations native of foreign would rest passive spectators of so many calamities? Could it be thought that they would resign themselves to death as quietly as the sheep and camels slaughtered by them during the sacrificial ceremonies. Here we see an example in this debate over this French proposal to close the sea lanes of the ways in which different populations are seen as either potential perpetual victims of the spread of disease, namely Europe, and then who's capable of being sacrificed or um, rendered disposable for the sake of those interests and those bodies. Concerns about the economic risks of disease spread were not limited to European empires and neither were xenophobic practices associated with concern. The United States has a history of anti-Chinese sentiment in response to epidemics. Historian James Moore has described how in Honolulu, doctors, colonial administrators, and the general US colonial population lamented the outbreak of bubonic plague in 1900 because it prompted fears that the city would become associated with Asia where the plague was then present. As plague spread in Honolulu and countries around the world closed their borders or quarantined all vessels arriving from its port, the Honolulu city administrators embarked upon a full quarantine of the city's Chinatown, allowing no one to leave. These quarantines imposed considerable hardships on those within, limiting employment, movement, and access to supplies. The area of quarantine encompassed Chinese and non-US properties immediately near the harbor, but avoided buildings and businesses they were owned by white Americans and immediately connected to sites of quarantine. Ultimately, as pictured here, the public health authorities burned contaminated buildings, but fires spread beyond their control and consumed most of Chinatown, or the Chinatown in flames. And we saw similar anti-Chinese responses occurring in San Francisco during the plague epidemic of 1900 and 1904, when Chinese-specific quarantines were enacted. And this, particular form of epidemic Orientalism has also contributed 
to the groundwork for exclusionary immigration laws against um, against uh, Chinese uh, immigrants and those immigrating from um, from broadly East Asia uh, in the 19th century. The Page Act of 1875 um, banned the immigration of Chinese women to the United States, and which was justified in large part of the perception that Chinese women were immoral or guilty of sexual misdeeds, but also carried diseases more virulent than those that already existed in the United States. Ultimately, the Chinese Exclusion Act banned all immigration to the United States in 1882. And these um, laws, the passage of these laws contributed to the groundwork for later exclusionary immigration laws against Central and South Americans, Mexicans, as well as Southern and Eastern Europeans. The homogenization of Asian into a bureaucratic racial group in the United States became a mode for establishing racial difference from white populations in America, as well as a powerful binary mode for distinguishing ideas of masculinity and gender, as well as race. As according to uh, Sucheta Mazumdar and Erica Lee, the presence of Chinese sex workers in the 1870s in California represented a sexualized racial danger capable of ruining white American domestic virtue and moral and racial pollution. Not only this, the, particular, the perception of the particular virulent strains of venereal diseases could poison Anglo-Saxon blood. So we see here disease and the threat of epidemic becomes a powerful force for sedimenting difference. Public health actors in the late 18th and 19th century, and so late 18th and early, or late 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, believe that a variety of diseases, including parasitic diseases, were more common among Chinese immigrants and were used as a basis of exclusion, especially at Western points of entry. So, as I conclude, um, you know, and that this was a kind of whirlwind tour of this uh, that was deeply theoretical, but also highlighted some of the um, empirics that I work with to think through these issues. I want to end with thinking about the role of archives in this project and fundamentally beyond. Indeed, perhaps the pandemic of COVID-19 more than any book ever could exposes the terrifying nearness of the 19th century, its violences, its pandemics and loss of everyday, loss of life. And I think that you know what I've depicted should highlight and, and linger with us, you know, in its haunting nearness to our present uh, COVID-19 discourses. And archives like the NLM bear testament to this. The past worlds described, I, that, that I've described perhaps bear less of a chronological relationship to our current times than a palimpsestic one, modified or written over to make way for the new while showing the obvious traces of what was there before. In this, we find the endurance of epidemic orientalism, that discursive framework that, like a shadow, is cast upon global responses to disease threats. In this presentation and the wider book, I have to show that, that the continuities and disjoints within the history of international disease control and the legacies of colonial practices of disease control in some, in some ways persist to this day. And this highlights the persistent and durable force of colonial practices of disease, of, of, um, zoo, of colonial discourses and imperial knowledge systems to maintain into our common sense understandings of the world in what may be considered a post-colonial world. At the, at the same time, I demonstrate how the practices of disease control can shift significantly while retaining in so many ways um, the deeply racial xenophobic and anxieties around infectious disease, motivated by concerns of disease spreading to the West um, from the rest of the world. So this should raise further questions of the ways in which we casually periodize areas in international health. The end of formal systems of colonialism and remote sovereignty retained many of the same anxieties, desires, or sovereign power and ideologies that were at work previously. And the transference of the International Sanitary Conventions into the International Sanitary Regulations in some ways trans um, ensured their transition while also shifting um, to actually challenge them in many others. I want to note that in this work and in engaging with NLL archives, I often teach the materials that um, I look through. This, for instance, is an article uh, by William Gorgas, which I use to teach in my class, Plagues, Power, and Social Control, and a host of others, to think about the ways that we can actually look at and consider the histories of international health and international public health 
um, respond to them and engage with them in, in productive ways to produce better, more equitable um, and humane policy. So to conclude, archives are spaces which gives us insight into these discourses, the ways in which dominant narratives are framed and also expose, expose moments of resistance. And what must be remembered is that these durable historical discourses continue to shape and condition our present and the possibilities for our health responses. And I wanna add that you know, this enduring perspective of disease threat framed through kind of the position of um, a sanitarily superior West against the rest of the world, I think needs to be fundamentally challenged in future infectious disease controls and regulations and recognized in order for us to develop more equitable, effective um, and responsive pandemic um, regulation. So with that, I'll end and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Dr. White, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. Uh, wonderful. Um, to those who are watching, uh, you'll find a live feedback button under, your, under the video feed. You can use that to send a question that will come directly to me uh, and I'll triage them and uh, share them with our, our speaker today. Uh, we have two questions um, right out of the gate. Uh, and by the way, if anyone's on Twitter and they wanna send a, a question, uh, use the hashtag NLM His Talk. Um, so our first question, uh, Dr. White, is at least in the case of the United States in the latter 1800s and the early 1900s, there was sanitary xenophobia that included, as the speaker mentioned, as you mentioned, Eastern and also Southern Europeans. So was or is the issue of Orientalism uh, or, or more, or was it more generic xenophobia? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, one thing I, I, I want to mention is that, you know, by and large, the epidemic Orientalism that I'm discussing is kind of within the international sanitary conferences, the conventions and the international health regulations. But um, this is a really great question because at one of the international sanitary conferences, there was large discussion about the controls of um, up, set upon um, the Hajj and from Muslim, Muslim pilgrims traveling through the Suez Canal. And actually, an Amer one of the American delegates, um, you know, mentioned specifically, you know, this this sounds like a good plan that we should apply to um, to to uh, Europeans immigrating to the United States, at which point um, there's this interesting moment in, in the conference where um, ostensibly it said that, you know, this um, was met with uh, little interest from the European parties and that the uh, that particular conversation will be tabled for another time and it doesn't come up again. <laughs> so, so I think that, you know, what, what, we, what we see in the International Sanitary Conferences conventions are sometimes the policing of those boundaries. And we also see that, um, you know, uh, I didn't have time to mention this, but we also see that the ability to sanitarily control colonial populations becomes a signifier of Western superiority. So the French, for instance, who are, you know, no friends of the British, especially in the mid 19th century, are constantly trying to demonstrate a superiority in infectious disease control over um, Britain for the, the fact that, you know, fundamentally that cholera is being found to, to um, be emergent in particular moments in British controlled India. So this becomes a marker of kind of um, a sort of geopolitics of sanitary authority that France is claiming over Britain. And this become this is a debate that kind of lingers across many of the early international sanitary conferences. So it is xenophobia, but I would argue that there's also a particular brand of um, xenophobia um, and which melds with imperial um, oh, imperial and also broadly uh, economic anxieties um, that that exist separate from that xenophobia. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you. Uh, another question regarding myths of modernity and ontological conventions as a contributing factor in health policies. Does the practice of colloquially naming a disease after the area where it was first documented, for example, Spanish flu, Japanese encephalitis, Russian flu, China virus, impact policies and responses to epidemics? 
Absolutely. And I think that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, you know, what a part of what I demonstrated in the latter chapters, and I showed you mostly kind of things that were going on, especially with um, the materials I used from the NLM, but, you know, what you see in the latter chapters of the, of the book is actually the actors within the WHO actively grappling with and trying to challenge these systems in a variety of different ways and getting either pushback from or just having to consider um, the epidemic orientalism or epidemic orientalism of the member states of the World Health um, Association or the of the World Health Assembly, right? Um, so you know we we know that the um, the World Health Organization in the mid 2010s um, put forward a guidance on infectious disease naming that said that you know we shouldn't name we should no longer name diseases after um, I believe it was particular professions or trades, the place that they emerge from, or use particularly evocative um, names like, you know, um, hemorrhagic fever, for instance, when the fact hemorrhagic, the hemorrhagic aspect like with Ebola is actually quite rare. So Ebola virus gets disease, gets turned to Ebola, certainly Ebola hemorrhagic fever transitions into Ebola virus disease, um, diseases like Legionnaire's disease or Middle East respiratory syndrome. Those conventions are, you know, going to go away. Um, but we've seen this come up time again, time again with the, with conversations about COVID variants, which makes it very difficult. And you know, especially with um, the Omicron variant first being um, you know isolated and discussed in South Africa, led to very significant travel uh, controls against um, much of Southern Africa. So we we do see the ways in which um, the geographic association with disease has very negative outcomes that needs to be, um, you know, that we need to consider and manage in the practice of infectious disease response. Thank you. Um, another question that's come through, could you comment on the relative lack of discourse or concern in the West about the chronic pandemic of tuberculosis in Africa, Asia, and South America? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is this is one of the. You know, I guess I guess the 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 mirror to my to my talk is that you know, in talking about diseases like plague, cholera, yellow fever, COVID nineteen, um, what's evident is that these are diseases that um, largely were not um, prior to the emergence of an epidemic endemic in spaces like Europe and North America, right? Unlike um, you know, for instance, tuberculosis or how malaria was even in, in much of the 19th century. Um, so, you know, what I think is, is so fascinating and important to recognize about tuberculosis as a kind of um, political phenomenon is that obviously no disease or very few diseases highlight so clearly the relationships between um, social and economic inequality and risk of disease severity, like COVID, or like like, um, like tuberculosis. And I think that the, um, you know, while I don't discuss tuberculosis in relationship to epi epidemic orientalism, I think the, the fact that um, TB can be both screened for and also is unlikely to present in its acute state in um, much of Western Europe or the or or North America. Um, certainly reflects at times how it's been um, prioritized, at least within um, regulations, but also um, you know how it's responded to in, in the field of global health. Absolutely, absolutely, um, it is not considered a problem of um, Western Europe and, and, and North America necessarily, in the same ways that we might think it should be in order to resolve the global global issue. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, sure. This, this pandemic is perhaps the first time in modern history wherein Americans and Western Europeans face travel bans from other parts of the world due to hygiene and health concerns. Uh, how do you think that might shape American or otherwise Western control actions going forward now that we've sort of got a taste of that medicine, so to speak? Yeah, I, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a phenomenal question. Um, you know, I think I think that that's the, um, you know, that's so much the part of what um, 
what I kind of wanted to, what I wanted to open with, um, you know, and I, I think rather than providing um, a full explanation, I really just wanted to kind of conceptually outline some of these questions. And I think that this, this kind of, we, we have lived very comfortably with a vision of our um, protection from disease, but also our protection from the um, regulatory effects perhaps of, of epidemics. And I think, um, I think now that I think epidemic orientalism is much more evident in day-to-day -day epidemic practice. I, I don't, it wasn't when I first wrote, you know, my dissertation um, in 20, or when I finished the dissertation in 2018, but I think, I think that, you know, rather than retreat to the way we've been doing things um, for the last 150 years or so, we should think about and consider this, this, this um, prevalent discourse in the way that we handle policy in the way that we reflect on things and perhaps not prioritize or to, to move beyond prioritizing a perspective rooted in um, a Western ability to remove oneself from the realities of an epidemic, but rather one that's situated, I think, exactly in those experiences, in the experiences of isolation, the experiences of acute epidemic disaster, which um, I think produces feelings of empathy rather than um, highlighting difference. Um, you know, I, I know that could sound rather um, ersatz and, um, and touchy-feely, but I think actually very realistically, this is good, this, is, this would produce better policy and I think we can um, push forward in this way. Dr. White, thank you very much for your presentation today and for kicking off our 2022 virtual series of NLM History Talks. It's been a pleasure and privilege working with you and wish you every success with your further research and your forthcoming book. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care.